So I joined Bristol a couple of years back. Um, I'm going to talk kind of about something that's older, but will be revisited here in Bristol, as well as something that's fairly new. Uh, and yeah, it's mostly practice. Uh, I'm a card carrying experimentalist. This is not going to go well. Um, let's try it. This. Oh, God. Very good. OK, that should work. And that should work. Yeah. OK. So um, before I get started, how many of you are experimentalists? <laughs> this is awesome. OK, how many of you know anything about atomic physics? Or I mean, are comfortable with atomic physics? All right, you know, OK. Yeah, all right, I'm still going to teach you some atomic physics. So if, you know, if you're a card-carrying atomic physicist, you can fall asleep for the next five minutes, and you're welcome. Uh, but basically, alkali metal atoms, um, which are really what I like to play with, um, like my favorite atom, rubidium-87, and yes, I do have a ranked list, uh, have one electron in an unfilled orbital. This sort of makes them hydrogen-like. For an experimentalist, this just makes my life easy because then they're relatively easy to control. And this is a quantum control conference. We're all, in some sense, uh, control freaks, right? So what does this energy level structure look like? Um, this is kind of a, a crash course in how one actually pools atoms, uh, as opposed to my usual answer, which is very careful. Um, and so remember from your atomic physics uh, lectures or whatnot, spectroscopic notation, where you've got your various quantum numbers, your you know overall orbital, your spin angular momentum, your total ang or your angular momentum in terms of motion, your total angular momentum, which is L plus S, um, all sorts of good stuff. So rubidium, the ground state of rubidium is this 5, 2, S, 1 half state. And one of the nice things is that these two excited states, this sort of D1 and D2 line, that pop up in all alkali metals. You could talk about the you know sodium doublet, that lovely yellow doublet that gave street lamps their lovely kind of sickly yellow color up until we replaced everything with LEDs. Yeah, that's that. Um, and so here, just to give you an idea of scale, these are at sort of 795, 780 nanometers. They're trying really hard to be red, but they're not quite there yet. And one of the nice things is that actually uh, these are pretty easy wavelengths to make laser-wise. So this is fine structure, just taking into account J, L, and S. But indeed, the uh, rubidium atom has some sort of nuclear spin, which we have to then take into account. And this gives us another good quantum number F, which is I, which is the nuclear spin, plus J, which is our total angular momentum. And this gives us hyperfine structure. So our ground state splits into two states. This excited state here, the D2 line, is my best friend. Uh, at least when it comes to atom trapping and cooling. And so you get these lovely three states up here. And you say, great, that's very nice. Now, let's use this to cool. Uh, we can cool atoms down to about 125 microkelvin, not by putting them in a cryostat. Um, when I came to Bristol, nobody knew anything about atom cooling, and they were asking me where, my, where I was going to put my cryostats. I was like, I, what cryostat? Um, so basically what we use instead of a cryostat is a combination of magnetic fields and laser fields, hence the magneto-optical trap or MOT. I'm going to wave my hands a bit at Sisyphus cooling and whatnot. Basically, you can get colder, which is nice. Looks something like this. Our atoms here in the center. We hit it from all sides with light pressure. Light is like wind to the atom. This cools it down. Um, and the magnetic field here in this anti helmholtz gradient uh, configuration that you can see gives us a magnetic field gradient. The atoms like to sit where the magnetic field is zero if we played all of our cards right. And lo and behold, this works. Um, how we actually do this in practice is that we just sit here on this cycling transition that's slightly detuned from this two to three resonance. Um, and the reason why it's detuned is because Doppler effects are a thing. And it will sit there, and the atoms will just sort of go, yay, up and down and up and down and up and down. And with each cycle of this, because they'll sort of spontaneously emit in all directions, we can tell them, no, 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 if you're moving this way, you're going to see a laser beam coming from the opposite direction, and that's going to sort of kick you in the direction that we want you to go. Um, now, we need some repumping light because actually this is not a closed transition, and every now and again, a rogue atom will fall down into this state. And if we don't have this repumping light, basically, we end up with a very dark cloud of atoms that aren't really all that cold. So that's what your experimentalist friends mean when they talk about needing a repumper laser as well. Um, and actually, if you get these atoms cold enough, 
and you have to go, you know, I'm going to wave my hands a bit at how we do this. It's very similar to how one actually evaporates the hot atoms in a cup of coffee. Um, we literally call it evaporative cooling. But if we can get these atoms down to about 100 nanokelvin, uh, their de Broglie wavelength is going to be on the order of the interparticle spacing, which is going to be on the order of the optical wavelength. This is known as the Bose-Einstein condensator, BEC. And so this is the tool of the trade. This is what Dominique was talking about. This is to some degree what Eloise was talking about. And really this is, you know, this is sort of our starting point. And so this is the canonical picture that all experimentalists have. Here are the, you know, atoms and molecules in this room at about 300 Kelvin. There's my thermometer. Um, and they're basically billiard balls. We can make them cold with our magneto-optical trap that I talked about. And then again, we can make them even colder down to BEC, where you get this canonical picture that was on the cover of Science. Um, and Eric Cornell is both a hell of a scientist and a hell of a softball player. Um, this is what happens when you spend 12 years in Jilla. Uh, the atoms become mutually coherent, like the photons in a laser, uh, which is pretty fun because our atom laser you know, my slightly deranged atoms are indeed, you know, more or less coherent, but they can also be excellent sensors because, for example, they fall under gravity. And it's actually a very good thing that my laser doesn't do that. Otherwise, there would be a lot of corrective optics. Um, but it's good that the atoms do. So how do we actually control this? Uh, we can trap atoms in light just by an induced dipole moment. I'm going to kind of run through this quickly so I can get on the, onto the fun stuff. It gives rise to a force and a potential. It's basically the, uh, the, the potential is going to be proportional to the intensity of the light. And what we can do is we can detune our light red of the atomic resonance, and then this will be attractive. Blue of the atomic resonance, we get something that's repulsive. So we can sit here and we can make either tractor beams for atoms, a la Star Trek, or we can make ourselves uh, nice little atomic barriers. Look something like this, focus down an atom, like into an optical tweezer, or focus down light. Atoms like to hang out in the, in the center there. Um, and the depth of the trap is going to look like the intensity divided by the detuning. And the scattering rate, which is all the stuff that I don't want, is going to look like the intensity divided by the square of the detuning, which leads us to the only thing you actually need to know about this slide, which is that what I want is a lot of power from a laser far detuned from resonance. And the risk assessment people at my university are having you know, small aneurysms when I tell them about the power of the lasers that I now have. Well, you know, that's my problem, not yours. Um, then we have an optical lattice, or egg carton for atoms. Basically reflect this laser back onto itself. You get a sinusoidally varying potential with some depth V sub naught. This case of L is 2 pi over our lattice wavelength. Looks something like this. Laser comes in, hits a metal mirror. Maxwell's equations force us to have a node at the mirror. Comes back, and lo and behold, we get something that looks like an egg carton. And this depth we typically express in terms of the photon recoil. This is just a nice way of uh, you know, scaling things in a sense. And this will become actually quite important because I'm going to talk about two different regimes of this lattice depth, but the two different prob um, problems that I'm going to mention today when we get to the fun stuff. Works in up to three dimensions. In 2D, you get a series of tubes like the internet. Um, and if you got that joke, you're my best friend. Uh, and then in 3D, you basically, in the qubit configuration, you get a nice little set of nodes. And you can play all sorts of fun games to get triangular lattices. Uh, Ole Schneider in Cambridge has like a Kagome-style lattice, whatnot. I'm boring. I just reflect my, uh, my lattices back in a Cartesian configuration. Because it turns out there's a lot of fun things you can do when you're bored. Um, how do you describe the atom wave function in the lattice? And this is how, um, you know, this will be important in terms of both differentiating between the two different uh, projects that I'm going to talk about, but also Dominique gave a very nice uh, introductory overview. So two equivalent bases are pretty, are pretty much commonly used. One is the block function that Dominique mentioned, where our atoms are going to be delocalized in position, and because Fourier is in play here, this will then be localized in momentum space giving rise to a band structure within a Brouillouin zone. And if you've ever done any uh, solid state physics, you've done this math. Um, and so we're indeed going to sit, as Dominique does with his work, at zero quasi-momentum. Although, of course, you could play all sorts of games at non-zero quasi-momentum. And the states actually look something like this. This is the ground state. 
uh, at zero and one quasi momenta in red and blue, uh, respectively. And indeed, it is delocalized within this infinite lattice, at least within uh, the approximations that we make with the map here. Good. Um, and indeed, they're quantized in momentum. And this is what you're seeing when you're seeing those little blobs in Dominique's talk, and you'll see more blobs in my talk. We love blobs of atoms here. Um, and in, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing this quantized set of momentum. And they're quantized in units of 2 h bar k, where k is again 2 pi over the lattice wavelength. So that's what's going on here. Understanding this quantization is very important to understanding the first half of what I'm going to talk about. There is also the Vanier function, which is localized in position space to a single lattice site. Looks something like this. And it's actually something that you get if you sum up all of the different quasi momenta within a given band. You apply the appropriate phases, which is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, and you can get something known as a maximally localized Vanier function, which is basically the thing that sits as much as possible on a single lattice site. This is composed of, uh, yeah, I talked. Great. Um, localized or delocalized, this depends on the lattice depth and the problem. So deeper lattices mean more localized atoms. And you can think about this in the sense that, indeed, the deeper your lattice is, the more likely it is for an atom sitting in a lattice site to uh, really only see that lattice site. And indeed, it's that cold atom in a deep lattice that gives rise to something you know, like a Bose-Hubbard style Hamiltonian, if you know what that is. I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's where this is coming. Good. Now, part one of the fun bit is actually going to be some work that I did in 2018. Um, and uh, this was, uh, there you go, there am I. Uh, as a PhD student, and I finished up, and I said, I'll never, ever, ever do this again. I came to Bristol. The funding agency said, are you sure? I said, no, I'm the best person in the world to do this. Please give me money. Um, and they said, yes. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit about what we did in the past and actually what's been done in Boulder since then, as well as what's been done in Toulouse that's relevant. Um, but the caveat is that we're, we think we know how to do it really, really well. So we're building one of these at Bristol. Good. So how do we build a sensor with atoms and optical lattices? Um, this is going to be similar to what Dominique talked about, but indeed similar but different. So let me try to highlight what I'm doing, and then where applicable, I'll talk about how it's different. The recipe here is that to take your favorite atom, and if you're like me, that's rubidium, and you make it very cold. You then load it into the ground state of a shallow optical lattice potential. That word shallow is doing a lot of work here. We're sitting here in the delocalized regime. What I'm controlling here are the momentum states. Um, and then we're going to modulate this lattice. We're actually only going to modulate its phase, although indeed we could modulate amplitude if we wanted. And we're going to implement this sort of atom optical elements of the interferometer. So what does an interferometer look like? Okay, that's our control. That's my number. Here's a light interferometer. If you did any sort of experimental physics in undergrad, they probably forced you to build one of these, and you all probably ran screaming from the room, whereas people like me were like, oh boy. Um, so, sorry. I, I mean this with all due respect, but I am going to make a little bit of fun. Okay, good. So you have a source of waves, you split it apart, it then propagates around some path, we can re recombine it, and then we detect it. And if we align everything nicely, you get this lovely uh, set of fringes. And indeed, if we rotate this system, you could see these fringes shift. If you measure how fast they shift, you've got something that's a rotation sensor. Great. Now, what happens if instead of laser light, I put atoms there? Well, that's kind of the whole point of atom interferometry. So what we did is working in this delocalized uh, basis, we started with atoms in the ground state of the lattice, looked something like this in terms of momentum space, and then we implemented these different atom optical elements. We started to shake the lattice, and indeed we split that into two, looked like this. Uh, we had equals uh, an opposite population in the plus minus two momentum state, um, and then we kept it going, and eventually we recombined it down into our original state. Um, and this is different from the types of interferometers that Ilya's uh, um, collaborator was working with, but also, I think, to some degree, although not completely, different from the type of interferometer that Dominique was talking about, 
because we really are interfering multiple states here at the very end. We're not just working with two states and you're not getting these lovely cosinusoidal fringes that a lot of folks get. And indeed, this is not a straightforward problem to solve with pen and paper. Uh, it's best to use optimal control, so we did. Um, I started with the genetic algorithm and then Dana apparently hung out with Ronnie a bit and came back and said, there's this thing called Krotov, you should learn it. I was like, okay. And then I, you know, came across a paper about this, this crab algorithm. And I was like, oh, this looks like this would work really well, closed loop in an experiment. And, you know, lo and behold, it did. So what do we do? Our measurement, just as Dominique mentioned, is the relative population in the atom's momentum states. We take pictures just like he does. We count up our atoms. We sit there and we go, look at the, re that the ratios between them. Um, and we define a vector P that's got the elements containing the relative populations in each state. Uh, we don't experimentally have access to phase information. You can get at it if you work open loop because you can sit there and you can say, oh, yes, this is what the phase probably is. And you can apply physics to this. Um, back in 2018, we really didn't do that. I mean, we knew about it, but uh, it was, we weren't, we, we weren't able to get open loop to work very well. And that was a carry problem, not a physics problem. I've since solved that problem. Uh, our pictures look pretty terrible. They look like this, but look at this lovely beam splitter, you know, 50-50. They let's ignore all this other stuff around here. That recombined state, uh, if you squint really hard, you can see a little bit of population back there. If you stop squinting, you can see that actually these atoms are quite uh, And so what we see is that we also have a lot of heating here. Um, it turns out that uh, other groups since then, including the group in Boulder, have made these images a lot prettier. And indeed, yours truly also knows how to make these images a lot prettier. Um, and actually, once this shaking function is known, it's fixed. Once we know how to sort of make our interferometer do its thing, we're set. It's all good. So then we calibrate it. Uh, and by calibrating it, we literally accelerate the system. And no, I'm not taking my experiment and shoving it across the room, although sometimes I might want to. Uh, we actually just use a magnetic field gradient. Uh, we make sure this is sort of, these are tricks that we kind of sweep under the rug, but we make sure that our atoms remain spin polarized so they can uh, respond to magnetic fields. And we say, okay, here's a magnetic field gradient that's going to look like an acceleration. We can calibrate that independently, and then we can say, okay, now we're going to start shaking our atoms and our lattice. So we did that. Um, and we can actually scale the sensitivity by changing the total shaking time. Um, and so we need to figure out if this actually works. Is there actually something that's measurable that's changing so that I can sit there and I can go, look, it's a sensor, and then I can make you know funding agencies happy. Um, but also science, but also lasers. Um, so we look at how these momentum populations change as a function of the applied acceleration, and indeed they do. All you need to get out of this plot is that these different lines correspond to different momentum states, and they change as a function of the applied acceleration. I don't need anything else out of that plot. If you'd been at my PhD defense, I would have talked you through it in all its gory detail. But all I need you to know is that this changes. And indeed, we can tell the difference between a positive and a negative change. So here's zero. And we can tell what happens if we're going in one direction versus another. Um, because again, you know, we can tell what red is versus what the blue line is doing. Um, and this is really nice. You don't have to make sure you're sitting on the edge of a fringe. You get this for free. Um, and we had to quantify kind of the minimum bound of what we could uh, distinguish in terms of the acceleration. So we used the classical Fisher information, which I believe has been talked about before. Um, but indeed, it just looks like this. It's derivatives of this momentum vector with respect to the acceleration. And you square it and you divide it by the vector itself. Um, and we actually can use this to figure out how our uh, minimum detectable change in acceleration scales with time. Um, and indeed, we get something that looks like in uh, our exponent, our t to the n, looks like it's about 2, which is what we expect. Because really, fundamentally, this isn't going to be much different from your traditional run-of-the-mill atom interferometer. So what are we doing now? What's evolved since 2018? Well, we're going to build one of these in Bristol. So this is my lab down in the basement of the NSQI building. You're all welcome to come see it. It's gorgeous. There's more stuff in it every day. 
This is a lovely vacuum center that was a uh, uh, chamber provided to us by our friends at Inflection. Um, it's actually got capabilities for rubidium and cesium. And the goal now is to build up all the stuff around it to make the atoms very cold and then shake them and make them you know, do our bidding. Uh, we'd like to actually demonstrate a multi-axis sensor, something that can de uh, demonstrate acceleration and rotation on all three axes. Uh, people seem to really like that. So this thing can have a three-dimensional lattice. Um, and we've got a couple of open questions. One is actually, what's the best scaling with this T that we can get? We can build interferometers a lot like what uh, Dominique was talking about, where we sh this should go as T cubed. Can we get T to the fourth? You know, is that possible? Um, we're not sure. We need to figure this out. Uh, how robust is this in the real world? The point being that the whole reason why we might want to do this is that the atoms remain trapped throughout the interferometry sequence. Is this something that's actually robust? Is it even scalable to the point that we could take something like this, and I haven't even shown you the optics table behind it full of lasers, and turn it into something that's actually feasibly small? Uh, some of my friends at Imperial are doing something like this with similar systems, so we think that there's nothing intrinsically stopping us from making this scalable. Um, and actually, we're continuing to do a bit of work on this. This is some work that Sophie's done uh, just to show that one could actually make a mirror hole. So it takes any momentum state and turns it into its opposite momentum state. And by any, I mean anything quantized by 2H bar K. Uh, so we are kind of looking at this, and we're looking at this with something with a lot of the tools that Sophie will talk about tomorrow, and I'm not going to spoil her fun. Um, and then the third open question is really, what are the fundamental limitations? Both in terms of sensitivity, but also in terms of, you know, the things that the people that want to put this onto, you know, boats are interested in. You know, the size, the weight, the power, the cost, et cetera. Good. Okay. So now with the next 15 minutes, let's talk about something that we did because we thought it was fun. And we're not even sure it's going to be useful, but we did it because it was fun. Uh, so this is some work on uh, generating uh, GKP states in ultra-cold atoms. Uh, this is work that was mainly done by my PhD student, Harry Kendall. Um, and you know, I uh, sort of told them where to go, so I get to be last. Uh, but then also our friend Giacomo, who's an expert in quantum optics. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, this is, I will say, Primarily a theoretical proposal, although we can do this experiment in the same system that we have down in the basement in Bristol once we get the system in the basement in Bristol work. So before we go on to that, what actually makes a quantum state interesting? Well, there's this, uh, our friend, the Wigner function. If you do any quantum optics, you're probably uh, a friend of, of Wigner's or his you know, close friend, uh, I guess, Husimi and the other various uh, distributions. Um, and actually, the Wigner function gives rise to something that isn't a probability distribution. And any negativity that one sees in the Wigner function, which is why it's not truly a, uh, a probability distribution, can give rise to something that's uniquely quantum. These are also kind of called non-Gaussian states, although my definition of it and other people's definition of what is non-Gaussian might be a bit different. Um, so this actually is just shamely ripped from Wikipedia and cited because I'm a good scientist. Uh, here we've got the uh, ground state of the harmonic oscillator, the Wigner function. This is an X and P space, so phase space. The first excited state here. Oh my gosh, there's some Wigner negativity. And then here's the, uh, I think this is the fifth excited state. And again, you see these ripples and all of the things that you learned about in your quantum physics class, um, indeed in phase space, nice and Wigner negative, nice and interesting. Um, and if you want to learn more about this, there's a really fun uh, PRX quantum with probably one of the best titles I've ever seen. Uh, I thought this was really good, uh, really good fun. So let's go back to how we describe our atom wave function in the lattice. The first half of what I talked about was all here. Now I'm in Vanier land because now I've got a very deep lattice. And what actually happens is that you end up with discrete vibrational levels within a given lattice site. Your atoms are no longer delocalized across the lattice. Now I'm just considering a single atom with arguments very similar to what Dominique was making. It doesn't matter all that much if there's two or three or even 10 atoms in a given lattice site. It doesn't really change the physics all that much. Um, and so what we end up with is uh, if we isolate a single lattice site here, just kind of chops 
this guy off here. We end up with these vibrational levels, which I'm going to suggest suggestively label as Fox states. And these are our Fox states, and this is what we'll actually use to define our GKP state. Now, what's a GKP state? If you know about this, congratulations, you can fall asleep for the next 30 seconds, or, you know, 13 minutes if you like. Um, this is from Gottesman, Kataev, and Preskel, uh, encoding a qubit in an oscillator. These are just nice ways of encoding qubits that might have some error correction intrinsic in them. You can argue, well, do you really even need this with atoms? And I can say, well, I don't know. Let's find out. Uh, Looks something like this. Uh, this is actually just a, a Dirac cone. Now, uh, nature seems to abhor a singularity, which is exactly what this is. So actually, we have to have uh, you know these lovely states, which are very nice for error correction, because if they dither around a little bit in space, as long as they don't dither by half the amount, um, which your one state is actually defined as the same cone, but shifted by half the distance between, then it's actually fairly straightforward to say, ah, yes, no, 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 you're indeed this state, and shift it back. Um, and, you know, because of this, we, uh, because of the whole not liking singularities, we end up with these finite squeeze states, which are plotted here as a function of this parameter beta, um, which defines both a Gaussian envelope that uh, covers this entire set of comb states, but also the width of these states. And so you see if this beta parameter is too high, we get something that's extraordinarily boring. And as it gets lower and lower, we get something that's increasingly interesting. Um, and there's a whole bunch of arguments as to you know how interesting is interesting enough. Um, so the Wigner functions look like this. So this is basically that. Um, but this plot here, but now in phase space, uh, I took this straight out of strawberry fields um, because they just have lovely, lovely images. And so what we're trying to do is make something that looks kind of like this. I think our beta values were about 0.15. We'll find out. So how do we do this? Well, what we want is we want a high lattice depth because then we can fit more fog states in there. And the more fog states we have, the higher our squeezing. And so you can see that we've got our lattice step on the y-axis, our required basis size on uh, this other right-hand y-axis, and then the no the amount of squeezing that we have. And recent papers have said, ah, oh, yes, you need at least 10 dB of squeezing to do something useful. Um, don't ask me why. That's just, you know, I'm going to say, read, go read the paper. Um, and so at about 1,500 recoils, so that's quite a bit. Uh, the shake and lattice stuff that I was talking about with the interferometry beforehand, that was like five recoils, 10 maybe, right? If you go too high, you actually start to ruin what makes it a nice interferometer. Now we're like a few, a couple orders of magnitude higher than that. Now this is, this is non-zero. Uh, we get 24 bound states, 10 dB of squeezing. That's very nice. And, and indeed it looks something like this. Uh, this is only a 400 recoil depth with 12 bound states, but you get the idea. Down here, they look a lot like harmonic oscillator states. Up here, they start to look a lot less like harmonic oscillator states, both in terms of spacing and in terms of the state itself. But this is how we're going to define our Fock basis. Now, what we can then do is by using, we just use grape for this. Uh, the folks in Aarhus developed a C++ library. Uh, Harry, my PhD student, has uh, just loves C++, so he took it and he ran with it. Um, and he was able to make states where our ideal state uh, with this 10 dB squeezing, uh, again, I think that's about beta 0.1-ish, uh, 1, 1 uh, the actual states that he made for both the 0 and the 1 GKP states uh, look like this. Um, and so this is taking into account a lot of realistic parameters about the lattice and the atoms. Um, and actually, this, this transfer protocol takes about 150 microseconds, give or take. And this is interesting when you think about things from an experimental point of view, which is what I was interested in. Great, you can make, you know, I don't think that there's a question really of, you know, controllability here. It's more, can you make this in a time where something might actually, something useful might actually happen? So let's talk a bit about these experimental considerations. Um, our protocols are viable with respect to laser power wavelength. Um, there are ways that you can actually me directly measure the Wigner function of atoms in an optical trap, although I think that the methods that uh, 
people like Cindy Regal and Dominique have come up with uh, more recently are probably what we'll start with. Um, but this is some interesting work uh, that came out of uh, Andrea Alberti and Dieter Meshida's group. And I'm not just saying that because I'm there. Uh, I really didn't think that this was super cool. Um, and we use this because it was our, our worst case scenario. Because in order to get these state-dependent lattices, you actually had to park yourself between the D1 and the D2, the D2 line. This limits your detuning, which then limits your scattering rate. So we use this as a worst case scenario. And indeed, we can sit there within about 3% of the atom li uh, lifetime in the lattice. Oops. And our controls look something like this. We are looking into doing some sort of parameterization. We've been talking to Fila a little bit about this. Uh, and you know, how can we actually t turn this into something where if you look at the control and it's FFT down here, you know, where's the physics? We're working on it. We're working on it. We're also trying to build an experiment at the same time. And I've only got one PhD student. Uh, so what's next here? Uh, we should be able to do this experiment, which is very nice. Uh, one question that we have is the robustness of these shaking protocols. I think Sophie's going to talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. Um, but one of the students that we both co-supervised in Cardiff has been looking a little bit about characterizing this robustness, as well as there's another student. I don't think I have the paper, do I? No, okay. Uh, there's another student at USC who's been working on doing this in sort of a more analytic way. Uh, there's the question of entangling gates, which was mentioned in Tommaso's talk. Uh, and this comes from an idea that uh, Jakob Scherson and Klaus Mulmer had uh, in Aarhus while I was there, but I didn't work on this. Um, and so we're thinking about how can we do something useful there? Um, and then the other question is really, is momentum space encoding a better route? So here's the BEC printer, right? This thing is awesome. You know, could this, could these uh, momentum states in and of themselves be the Fock basis that is interesting? Um, and so I, this is a really cool paper. Go away and read it. Okay, Dominique doesn't have to go read it. He helped write it, but you know, this is fun. Um, and then, the other open question is, is this useful for anything? Again, we did this because it was fun. And like, that's why I do this. That's why I stand in front of you talking. And I, I, I work with the lasers and the theory and everything. Like, I do this because it's fun. But if it's useful, that's even better, right? Um, and you know, the, there's a lot of questions of whether or not these states can be used for sensing. And so there might even be a tie-in between the first and second halves of my talk other than, you know, Carrie does fun things with atoms and lattices. Um, so yeah, that's the end of it. I think I hit my 40 minutes on the dot. Uh, I'd really like to thank Dana Anderson and Jilla, who uh, basically gave me a lot of rope to hang myself with in terms of this uh, shake and lattice stuff, and we ended up making something cool. Uh, I got to do some really nice work with uh, Meshida Alberti and uh, Richard Winkelmann uh, in Bonn. Uh, they let me hang out there for a few weeks, which was really good fun. And then uh, the uh, Gecko group in Bristol. Uh, this is a backronym, and I'm told I'm not allowed to spell it with a Q. The G Generally Experimental Control and Quantum Optimization. Uh, and then uh, Harry Kendall and Giacomo Ferranti were really uh, helping to drive the GKP work. And that is indeed our mascot. Um, that's Emmy, named after Emmy Nether. Uh, she's my pet leopard gecko. And thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, so we have a couple of minutes for some questions, if anyone wants to kick us off. Uh, Brigitte. Um... Um, so the way that I want to do it is to treat it, at least in terms of the Hamiltonian, treat it semi-classically. Um, and so these are ideas. I've been trying to do this for, I don't know, Ronnie, when did I first email you about whether or not this was sensible? Like 2017? So I've been trying to do this for, for a while. But the idea is actually that if you take a uh, 2D lattice, and so we'll, what I talked about today was really just causing the atoms to go out and back. You add an acceleration to that, that's going to change that. Now, what you'll have to do is cause the atoms to go around in a circle. So very much like a Sanyak interferometer. Um, and so there are, I'm, I'm sweeping a lot of potential problems under the rug, which is why I can't say for sure that this is going to work. But uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Yep. 
they have. Yeah, they are the, the, the sort of the work with the paint. Yes. Yes, and indeed, um, there are there's a lot of work with with that, and then also uh, the painted potential folks as well have uh, done some, although not really as nicely as one might think. But I still think it's very cool. It's a difficult experiment. Uh, some question here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that the, the, the Sanyak that I'm talking about here, that would just be T squared. Um, because there's really, right, you know, how do you, you think about how do you get T cubed? You have to accelerate like you do with the Floquet work. And then how do you get T to the fourth? Well, do you have, need a now a, you know, time derivative of your acceleration or a jerk? Um, and there's really only been a couple of theoretical papers that talk about this. Um, I, with regards to the acceleration, the 1D system, I think getting T cubed is actually pretty straightforward. We talk about this actually a little bit in the NJP paper we wrote in 2018. Um, but in terms of getting higher uh, scaling for a rotation sensor, I would really have to think on that. Uh, an idea that we've had that I'm not sure is feasible because I'm not sure how much physics you can throw into it. And so I think it's very much like you have a, a giant black box and you have to kind of narrow down the set of uh, parameters that you're looking at is actually just optimizing on the Fisher information. Because at the end of the day, that's all you care about. And just making that scale as well as you possibly can. You know, who cares if it has a traditional beam splitter or whatnot? Um, but that's not something that uh, that we, you know, we're still working on getting to the point where we can do that. And uh, there's a question from here. So how do you compare or measure uh, the quality of the BZ, particularly if you're changing the geometry? Uh, yeah. So you can actually look at it's It's actually fairly straightforward. Go back. Um, and I'll just do this. Uh, so if you actually look at these images here, and I'm not going to bother to go to full mode, but you see here that this is after splitting and this is after recombination. You see all these other acids out here, right? Like that's heating, that's thermal. Those aren't condensed atoms anymore. So it's actually fairly straightforward. You drop them and you take a picture of them and they're either, you know, nice and cold and make these lovely, you know, round, beautiful, or actually not round, but beautiful clouds, or they have a whole bunch of crap around them. <laughs> and that, that, that's, you can, you can be quantitative from that picture, but you know, qualitatively, that's how you do it. Actually, maybe on, on the geometry point, I'm curious, like for the sensing that you do, does the, if you were to change the geometry, will it like particularly affect how accurate, like your, your Fisher informations that you can get? So if you want, move to like a triangular lattice or like a, like a, a you know, hexagonal lattice or something along those lines, um, I, what's, what's really going to happen, um, I don't know if that would affect sensitivity. Like, I, I think that's a, that's a really good question, but I, that I can't give you kind of a yes or no without going away and braining about it a bit. Um, one of the things that would change is actually when you think about the, uh, what actually matters in this problem, is that if you look, the transitions between these different block bands at zero quasi-momentum, that's really, those are the frequencies that matter, are kind of these going from here to here, here to here, here to here, or making kind of two photon jumps and whatnot. And so what's going to change as you change the geometry is those frequencies. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, any shaking outside of those frequencies is going to be heating. I mean, Ole Schneider and Emanuel Block put out a paper a while back uh, that, that did that, um, that showed that. But uh, in terms of sensitivity and, you know, is it easier to, you know, build an accelerometer or rotation sensor or something along those lines? Uh, I think that uh, different geometries could enable that, but I couldn't tell you. Do you have any, any other questions? If not, I'm going to monopolize my position and ask you one more. Awesome. <laughs> um, so, like, because uh, what you focused on for the sensitivity was looking at the fish information. Um, what's often neglected, uh, even by theorists, is that really you should probably look at the signal to noise ratio, right? Because mm -hmm. how sensitive it is is dictated by actually the size of your signal. Yep. And then there's, you can get very different profiles there. So yep. did you consider signal to noise rather than Fisher information? So we considered it. And here I do have to present because uh, 
then I have to work on my, uh, yes. So in, we considered it in the sense that we knew it was what was limiting us. Mm -hmm. um, so I showed you those images, right? You can see all the, the, the around. Um, that's actually what set this limit. Uh -huh. um, and that was actually just imaging noise. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, um, we didn't really give it more than a couple of sentences in the paper, like we could do better if our images were cleaner. Um, and I think that there's something about sort of imaging shot noise that's really going to, imaging shot noise and then at atomic fluctuation, mm -hmm. which I think they're both going to go kind of as root in, mm -hmm. uh, that's really going to limit us. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is, uh, it's not something we've considered in the sense of like being very quantitative about it, mm -hmm. but you're absolutely correct that like that is what will limit our ability to saturate that bound. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Cool. Um,